Hello, everybody. If you're here for Science and Nature Untapped, you are at the right place. I'll just give a few seconds to let people log in and to start watching. So just a little bit of housekeeping for everybody who's watching from Facebook Live. You can ask a question to our presenter uh, just in the comment section. And it's also always really uh, fun to see where people are tuning in from. So I'll just give a little uh, countdown for Gabe from your TV. So three, two, one, Gabe, it's all yours. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Science and Nature Untapped, a free virtual monthly speaker series. My name is Stephanie, and I'll be your host for this evening. So before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that many of us are living on unceded land and traditional territory of Indigenous peoples. We are grateful for the opportunity to live where we do, and we thank all the generations of people who have continued their responsibilities to Mother Earth since time immemorial. So for me, I live on Mohawk territory, but since this is online, um, you may live somewhere else in the country or somewhere else in the world. And so there's this great resource called native-land.ca, where it's a map and you can identify whose territory you're on. If you would like to keep up with any news from the River Institute or our events, research, uh, our education programs. You can follow us on the following social media platforms and at the following handles, as well as if you were to want to watch any of our old presentations, presentations we've done in the past, you can go to riverinstitute.ca slash on tap. So for upcoming science and nature events, we have December 8th, uh, Christina Charette, who will be talking to us about uh, aquatic food webs to our tables and the influence of exotic invasion on nutritional provisioning and contaminants in sport fish. And on January 5th, we'll be talking with Courtney Holden, Dr. Courtney Holden, and she'll be sharing about the secret life of American eels. So last week we had our 28th annual river symposium. It was a hybrid event that took place over two days. It was very successful. We we're very happy with uh, the outcome and everybody who came to see us on community day at the Ramada Inn and everybody watched us virtually. If ever you were interested in, um, in watching the presentations, you can go to the website. So riversymposium.riverinstitute.ca slash 2021. And so when you get on that website, you'll have two options. So you have community day, and then you just go and click to watch, it will bring you to YouTube. And you also have science day. So again, just click to watch and you'll see this as you scroll down the web page. So a lot of these events, so, you know, like science and nature untapped, the symposium, a lot of our research educational programs are uh, generously um, are, 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 are generously supported by our donors. So if you wanted to donate to the River Institute, you could go to riverinstitute.ca slash donate. And otherwise, just, you know, sharing on social media, talking to your friends about the work we do goes a really, really long way. And so for tonight, we're all here to here to hear from Brian Hickey on the conservation of little brown bats in Ontario. So Brian's research has brought him to Zimbabwe, the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, and to Ontario, Canada. While Brian is well known for his bat research, he has studied a wide range of taxa, including birds, fish, reptiles, and invertebrates. In addition to his role as a research scientist, Brian oversees the River Institute's education and outreach programs, which in 2019 received a national award from the Nature, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada for their excellence. So Brian, it's all yours. I'll uh, just invite you to share your screen. All right. I will share my screen. And open up my slides. All right, well, thank you um, for that introduction, 
um, uh, Stephanie. Um, as Stephanie said, I'm going to talk about the conservation of little brown bats in Ontario. And um, I usually try to avoid um, lists of acknowledgements during these talks, but because this is going to live on YouTube uh, for a long time, and because so many people help with this project, I just want to thank um, everybody who's helped with this project. This is a project that's been going on for a number of years, and I've been able to work with some amazing um, colleagues and students, including um, Alana Ackerman, Jordan Rua, Shayla Cruz, Kebby Brown, uh, Josh Filio, Lexi Harkwell, um, Lacey McDonald, Sarah Greenwood, who's done uh, a lot of my bat detector sound analysis work for me, um, Stephanie, who you just heard from, Stephanie Hildebrand, whose um, uh, pictures have helped spruce up my presentation, uh, but she's also uh, invaluable uh, in the field. Um, this, this work is um, not mine alone. It's work I've been doing in conjunction with Bailey Bedard from the River Institute and um, Ottawa U. Um, John Shedla at Environment Canada and Alex Pula at Ottawa U. Um, and, um, um, and also with many of you who are watching who are host uh, properties or own host properties for my bat houses that I'm going to be talking about, which are, uh, as you'll see, uh, if you don't already know, the focal point of much of my um, research. And it's, this has been funded by the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Parks, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, um, and the St. Lawrence River Institute, of course. Um, so I'm going to start with a quick um, overview, moving from left to right. I'm going to talk about um, declines of little brown bat populations, bats in general, but in particular little brown bats um, that have been devastated by a disease called white nose syndrome, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, but I'm going to um, hopefully teach you a few things you don't know about this fungus and why it's been so devastating. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the project that many of you listening have been a critical part of, and those are my efforts to help the recovery of little brown bats. Um, and then finally, if I have time, I'm going to talk about some um, other issues that are affecting bats, uh, mercury contamination and um, threats due to wind turbines. So um, white nose syndrome, many of you have heard about it. Um, it's, it's a lethal fungus. Um, it's one of many examples of an exotic invasive species that's arrived from uh, outside of North America. It's been uh, transported by humans into North America. It was first discovered in 2006 in a cave in northern New York State. Um, it's unusual because most fungi don't survive inside caves where it's very cold. Um, just a few degrees above freezing, but that's where this fungus that causes white nose syndo syndrome um, thrives. Um, it's deadly, it kills most of the bats it infects, uh, and it spreads rapidly. And this map just shows you the um, degree of spread. So if you um, see uh, where my cursor is here, this, this X, this is where it was first discovered in um, uh, 2006. And then within only about four years, all of these blue squares uh, in, um, were, um, were places where this fungus had been detected. So with only, uh, within only four or five years, it was up north of Lake Superior, and it was most of the way down right into the middle of the U.S., and then only a few years later, all of these yellow squares um, sh turned um, up positive tests uh, for the fungus. And within less than 10 years, it's on uh, both coasts. It's in Newfoundland. It's on the West Coast. So it's, it's spread really rapidly, um, and it's killed millions and millions of bats. Um, many populations have declined by more than 90%. Um, this is a picture of a cave. Um, in western Quebec. I think it's called, uh, this one is from La Flèche Cave. Uh, and um, now there are just no bats at all in this cave. Um, I say the decline has been greater than 90% in hibernation sites because I don't want to be um, accused of um, exaggerating, but in many places it's 99 or 100%. And if we think of some iconic species that have been in decline that people have heard about, you know, we've we've probably most of you have heard stories from people like Richard Leakey who have been talking about elephant declines. Um, the the lower picture uh, in the background here there is a black rhino 
Um, sorry for the poor quality of the uh, uh, of the photograph. Stephanie's would have been much better, but I didn't want to get any closer to that black rhino. Uh, so you'll have to just trust me that that's a black rhino. So these are some of the iconic African species that are famous worldwide for the uh, for their declines. Elephants have declined, some people say, by about 80 percent, but that's a decline that's happened over 50 to 100 years. Same thing with the black rhino. They've probably declined by 90 plus percent. But once again, this has been over decades and decades. American eels, which you're going to hear Courtney talk about, and which many of you have probably heard another of my colleagues, Matt Wendell, talk about, they've declined um, by numbers, probably in the 90% as well. But once again, over many, many decades, little brown bats have declined this much in only four or five years. So I think it's probably the fastest decline of a mammal since biologists have been documenting those kinds of things. So lots of people understand, yeah, bats are declining, but very few people realize how serious the decline this has been. And one of the reasons I think people don't realize how serious this decline has been is because I get this question all the time. So if bats are declining so dramatically, why do I have so many nuisance bats getting into my house? And uh, the answer is this fungus doesn't affect all bats equally. So big brown bats, the bat on the left, which you can see uh, photographed here inside a house, inside an attic, um, big brown bats um, often stay win all winter long in the buildings that they hibernate in, um, um, uh, sorry, th that they live in during the summer. They stay there and they hibernate in those same buildings. So they're not going into caves. And when they do go into caves, they're not going into caves uh, for quite as long a period. Little brown bats always leave in August or September uh, and they go into a cave and they spend a much longer period of time in the cave. So they're exposed to the fungus for a really long time for the entire winter. Um, and then there are other bats like hoary bats, which most people have never seen because they don't go into houses or caves. Um, so it's only the little brown bat and three other species that are um, affected by white nose um, syndrome to this devastating effect. So that's why you're seeing uh, bats in your attics, um, even though bats have declined so uh, dramatically. So, you know, they say a picture is worth a, a thousand words, or in this case, a thousand bats. On the left, this is a typical picture. Um, this is from the Hunt Mine, a, a, a site near Renfrew. But in the old days, I visited uh, hibernation sites in Renfrew, in um, Western Quebec, in Plantagenet, Ontario, uh, in um, um, near Westport. And all of these hibernation sites were packed with bats, some of them with many thousands of bats. Um, post white nose syndrome, um, that's the picture on the right. Caves and abandoned mines are completely empty. Um, so although I said the decline has been more than 90%, really in all of the caves that I study bats in or used to study bats in, the decline has been 100%. And that's not atypical. That's the scenario that's played out uh, many times in many parts of Ontario and as that map earlier showed throughout most of North America. So one of the researchers, uh, when we discovered this fungus in New York state, um, researchers uh, got busy and we've learned a lot about this, um, this fungus. Um, when you see a fungus in a forest, uh, a, a mushroom in a forest, that's the fruiting body. And that's just a small, uh, tiny portion of that organism's biomass. Fungi send out um, structures that I guess the, the closest analogy would be like roots of a tree or a plant. Um, they're called hyphae. And these extensions of the mushroom, that's the main biomass. And they, they spread through the soil. Well, in the case of this white nose um, fungus, uh, they uh, spread their hyphae through the skin of the bat. Uh, they get into the wing membrane um, here and they disrupt the skin in the wing and the skin elsewhere. 
um, they disrupt the skin's ability to prevent moisture loss. And so bats in caves that are hibernating uh, don't have access, regular access to food and water. Uh, they dehydrate and they, they wake up because of excessive dehydration. They try to find water to drink. If they succeed in finding water, it takes them a lot of energy to do that. It's winter, so there's no food. All the bats in Ontario eat insects, as many of you uh, probably know. Um, and so they end up dying of either starvation or, um, um, or dehydration. Um, so we now know how the fungus um, kills the bat. Um, we've also found something that can cure um, bats with white nose. And you're, if you're wondering why there's a banana plant in this talk about white nose, this cure comes from uh, banana. Um, it's a product that's been used. It's uh, of um, bacterial origin, um, I think, and it's applied to bananas to um, kill fungus that spoil bananas. Um, and this fungus that kills, uh, spoils bananas is related to the fungus that causes white nose syndrome. And so scientists in the lab have been able to treat infected little brown bats and cure them from white nose syndrome. And this is all interesting research and some of it like the potential cure is good news, but it's not really practical. Um, in this study that I was referring to, they cured 75 bats and that's great, but how are you gonna get this into all the caves? First of all, there's not enough biologists and money to pay biologists to go to all the caves and treat all the sick bats. Um, Secondly, we don't know where most bats hibernate. So um, I know of a handful of hibernation sites um, in this area, in Western Quebec and Eastern Ontario, but those aren't enough hibernation sites to account for all of the bats that are living in, or at least were living in all of the summer roosts. So it's just not practical. So the view I took was to take bats uh, and give them opportunities to move out of attics where they're often in conflict with landowners who don't want them there, who are sometimes evicting them in the middle of their reproductive season, uh, in the middle of the summer when they're trying to fatten up and get prepared for overwintering in caves. They need to find food. They need to be arriving at hibernation cell, um, sites healthy. Um, and when they're being chased by homeowners who are trying to get them out of attics, that's probably not really conducive to arriving at a hibernation site uh, well-fed and healthy. And we know that stress affects immune response. And so um, the, the approach I took was to distribute as many bat houses as I could and um, spread them over a wide area and allow bats opportunities to move into places where they're in conflict with humans, into bat houses on properties where people are welcoming them, and in many cases, going out of their way to protect these bats. And so that's what I did. Um, and I began this work um, in 2014. And um, the map on the right shows you the distribution of these bat houses year by year. I added more. Um, this map just shows the first three years of this project. We've now expanded our network of bat houses. We have more than 175 bat houses as far west as Kingston, uh, as far north as the Ottawa River, um, and with the main cluster in, in eastern Ontario that you can see here um, on the map. Um, on the left, the two left photos, those show some typical bat houses. We put them on posts. We put them on the sides of barns and other outbuildings. Um, in a few cases, we've tried some innovative things. The picture on the right here um, is an abandoned, an old, uh, no longer used stone silo. And we turned the entire top floor of that um, silo into one giant bat houses. So we tried to be innovative and we tried to use opportunities like the silo when we could. And uh, in other cases, we built these standard bat houses. These bat houses don't look very large. You can see by the ladder that's reaching up to the bat house on the side of the barn or shed there in one of those pictures. Um, doesn't look crazy large, but that bat house is big enough to hold at least a couple of hundred bats. People often 
think because they have 20 bats in their house, they're going to need at least two or three bat houses. Uh, these bat houses uh, house can house a lot of bats because bats are very small and they also like to be um, squished together side by side in large clusters. So um, uh, starting in 2015, uh, we began monitoring and each year we're monitoring more and more bat houses. And of the 175 bat houses, uh, um, I can't get to all of them in a given year. Um, and so I sometimes rely on reports from um, landowners um, and, um, and sometimes landowners' dogs. I have one landowner, uh, he could be listening now, who has an awesome bat dog who alerts uh, his master whenever the bats arrive each spring, and then he alerts me. So I've got a network that includes um, um, school children at Iona Academy who have their own bat house, uh, who will be going out there monitoring bats with their teacher. I have participants all over the province. And then when I can, I get out to some of them myself. Uh, and you can see one of my former um, summer students inspecting a bat house there. So as of the end of this past field season, um, we had a really great year in 2021 and, and also even in 2020, despite the uh, COVID lockdowns. Um, this year, um, I've documented 21 little brown bat roosts. Uh, eight of those were located in uh, some of the bat houses that I deployed on um, the properties I've just described. Um, another 10 were in bat houses that were deployed by landowners or other agencies independent of my work, but who have allowed me to um, incorporate their bat houses into my monitoring program. And then three roosts were located in in buildings. When people say they have bats in their attics, I sometimes try to pay them a visit. Um, expecting to find big brown bats, but hoping uh, for little brown bats. So uh, not only did we locate 21 roosts, at least six of these roosts had colonies with more than um, 100 bats. So that was also really encouraging. So the strategy of uh, providing uh, bat houses, providing safe roosting for bats, to allow them to build up their own natural immunity because that's really the only way bats are gonna beat um, um, this fungus is to build up natural immunity. Um, I recently was um, doing some work in Southwestern Ontario with another colleague who's working on bats there. And, and she's also starting to see similar things, bats starting to come back into bat houses populations starting to rebuild. So um, this seems to be not just something happening in, in my cluster of bat houses, people who have been doing similar work in other parts of the um, world are finding um, positive results um, as well. So it's great that they're using bat houses, but we really need to know um, if these bats or these bat house colonies are reproducing colonies. Um, and so um, one, of the, uh, um, one of the focal points this summer was to go out and capture bats with mist nets and um, determine whether we were catching newborn young. And you can't age a bat the way you can age some animals, uh, but you can distinguish adults from young. And the center picture here shows how you do that. We shine a light um, through the wing and bones in mammals start out as cartilaginous models. So the body lays down a cartilage outline in the shape of the bone that's going to develop. And then the cartilage is replaced by bone. And while the bone is still growing, like in a young bat, you can see little clear areas where the bone hasn't yet um, developed where the cartilage is still present. In humans, we sometimes talk about the growth plates at the end of bones. That's what I'm looking for by shining this light um, um, through. So by doing that, um, and also by recording some other basic information like body weights and bat forearm sizes, we were able to determine that um, at least five of these roosts um, were successfully producing young. Um, and about at the same rate that you would expect um, in a normal healthy attic roost um, pre-white nose syndrome. So the news um, 
I don't think little brown bats are out of the woods yet, um, but we I've gone from thinking they were destined uh, for extinction to now thinking they're probably going to rebound um, slowly. Now, this work has um, resulted in some new questions that have arisen. So one of the other things we've been doing, uh, we spent the summer focusing largely on documenting roosts, seeing whether they were successfully reproducing colonies, occupying this roost. Um, but then in the fall, I spent my time visiting several historically known um, hibernation sites that used to have lots of bats, but in recent years, um, the bats had been um, decimated. And um, in some of these sites, so what we did is we deployed um, a bat detector, like the one in the left picture here. Uh, this is a bat detector that stores echolocation calls, uh, the sounds bats use to navigate. And uh, we record and store these sounds on these detectors, and then we can listen to them and, um, and, and see what species they were because different species have different shapes to their echolocation call sonograms. And so um, I deployed these bat detectors at several hibernation sites. And the good news is we're finding bats in August swarming at the entrance to these caves and abandoned mines. Um, but it doesn't seem as though bats are actually entering the mines to stay over. Uh, in other words, they don't seem to be using them yet as hibernation sites. Um, so they're swarming at the entrances, but they're not going in there to hibernate. So uh, we don't know where they're going. We don't know where they're hibernating. Um, but finding out where these bats are hibernating um, is, is a high priority so that these sites can be protected. Um, often hibernation sites are um, um, destroyed before people realize they're important hibernation sites. Um, the other pictures here just show the microphone. This microphone was hanging over the entrance to this abandoned mine here near Westport. Um, and as of the end of my field season, no bats hibernating, no bats staying overnight. Now the swarming at the entrance, but not staying the night, that's a normal behavior in early um, August and into even early September. But usually by October, bats are starting to um, gradually accumulate inside a cave or a mine. So this swarming behavior at the entrance, we think is a bat's way of showing young bats migration routes. So they'll leave an attic, they'll travel to the entrance of a cave, they'll swarm, uh, adults will mate during that swarming period, and then they'll go back to their summer attic uh, or summer bat house, and they'll fly back and forth uh, many times over, um, um, uh, over the swarming period. And then eventually as the weather gets colder, um, fewer of them will be doing a trip back and forth and more of them will be staying permanently in the cave where they're going to hibernate. And uh, we weren't seeing that happen. So I don't know that if that's a white nose syndrome, maybe the bats are swarming in one cave and hibernating in a different cave because we do know that they don't always swarm at the same site that they're going to overwinter. Um, or maybe swarming season um, doesn't end until November because of our excessively warm um, fall uh, days that we've been having in recent years. The other question we have, which we've begun to work on, um, is to try to understand where bats in these bat houses are going um, to forage because we need to protect roosts, but we also need to have suitable foraging habitat for these bats. Um, this bat um, here on the right has a little miniature radio transmitter uh, that's been glued to its back, and that allows us to travel um, or to follow it as it travels um, to its feeding site. Uh, it turns out these bats are going quite far, even though many of these bats live um, right beside many of my colonies are. Um, along the Raisin River, and um, these, um, these bats have plenty of insects close by, right near their bat house, yet some of them are traveling 5, 10, or more kilometers each night. So that's another thing we're trying to understand. Why do they bother going so far when they have so much food so close? So um, that's, a, um, that's a recap of, of where we are with 
the little brown bat uh, recovery. So good news, little brown bats seem to be recovering and, um, and much more quickly um, than I ever would have thought possible because um, bats are very long lived. They live 30 years or more, uh, but they have very, very slow reproductive rates. So white nose, because of its devastating effects, has really um, been the main focus of a lot of conservation work. But bats have other um, threats that they're exposed to, including wind turbines, including contaminants uh, like uh, mercury. And um, the, the story of bat mercury research in Canada is kind of also the story of uh, my arrival and eventual um, employment at the River Institute. So I arrived as a bat biologist at the River Institute. And uh, one of the first things um, I thought is, how can I connect bats uh, to river ecosystem? Um, I was looking forward to working on, on fish and turtles and other things that are more traditionally considered uh, aquatic. Uh, but I had done my PhD working on uh, this animal in the photo here, the red bat. Um, and, um, and I wanted to continue some bat research. And I thought, um, you know, every ecologists always say that everything is connected to everything. And um, so let's see if I can connect bats to aquatic ecosystems. Um, and when I arrived at the in, uh, Institute, at the River Institute, there was lots of interest um, in mercury. Um, and um, we were looking at mercury and pike and walleye and um, often uh, also um, smaller fish that are the prey of those um, larger predatory fish. And, and I thought, well, you really should be looking at bats. And I don't think anyone was surprised that I said they should be looking at bats, but I had some reasons for that. Bats eat insects, but not just any insects. A lot of bats focus on insects that spend their larval lives, their development um, stages, uh, in the water, in sediments. And that's where mercury accumulates when we contaminate rivers, the mercury ends up in sediments. And so the insects bats are eating are growing up in those sediments. Bats eat large amounts of prey each night. Um, 50 to 100% of their body weight is not unusual. Um, that's like someone my size eating more than a thousand Big Macs. So they're really packing away those insects as I said a minute ago, they live to be more than 30 years. So they're exposed to a lot of mercury because they eat a lot of food and they're exposed over many, many years. And finally, they live in urban areas where um, often mercury contamination issues um, arise because of human activities. And we can sample their fur. So I'm, I tr I'm by background, a, a behavioral ecologist. So I like to study animal behavior. And with bats, you can clip some fur, document their mercury concentration, and then you can follow their behavior afterwards, which you can't do when you're uh, grinding up a fish or dissecting it to slice out a chunk of, of muscle um, or, or liver. And so for all these reasons, I thought you know, bats are going to be loaded um, with um, mercury. Um, so, um, but my, my new colleagues pointed out, you know, not so quickly there, Batman. Um, there's a couple of problems with this logic. Uh, they said they feed atop a very, very short food web or food chain, you probably won't see high mercury values at all. Uh, there's very little opportunities for bio biomagnification, which I'll explain in a minute. So you're probably wasting your time. Um, um, you might not even be able to uh, measure mercury. So I did what uh, I always do when people don't like my ideas. I headed out to some bat caves um, and um, um, tried to um, collect some, some samples. Um, now, the reason why um, people were skeptical that this was a really smart thing to do is mercury starts out often on land and mercury is natural. Volcanoes spew mercury all the time, but we've added to mercury by industrial activity and the mercury flows into the water in the water, often the form of mercury that industries produce isn't the most toxic form of mercury, but 
in the water, it gets transformed into methylmercury, and that's the kind it gets into animals. That's the kind that is most toxic. And in an aquatic food web, web typically, you start with phytoplankton, plant-like plankton absorbing mercury, being eaten by animal plankton called zooplankton. They get eaten by insects. Insects get eaten by minnows. Minnows get eaten by bigger fish. They get eaten by the big predators. And finally, an angler um, has a meal out of one of the walleye he or she catches. And so in top predators like humans, um, there's a lot of opportunity for biomagnification. At each of those links, mercury concentration magnifies. It increases in concentration. So a bat, on the other hand, it um, feeds at the top of a food chain, just like humans do. But the difference is the food chain is very short. Bacteria in the water um, or decaying uh, organic particles being eaten by an insect, that same insect turns into an adult, flies up, that eats it. Really short food chain, very minimal um, opportunity for biomagnification. So we tend to get biomagnification uh, in humans uh, because we're way up in the food chain in river otters, in pike and musky and walleye, but we shouldn't expect that in bats. So I um, headed off to the bat cave and I went to some bat caves. I went to more bat caves. I rounded up. I had no money for this research. Um, I, so I rounded up. Um, volunteers, students, anybody who wanted to come and join me on a bat excursion and came back with some fur, um, didn't know how to analyze mercury at the time, uh, sent it off to some commercial labs and they measured mercury. Um, and the important thing here to keep in mind is this value here, 10, this is 10 parts per million. Um, at 10 parts per million, neurological effects of mercury can be detected. Um, and uh, big brown, and these are the averages, these bar represent the average mercury concentration of three different species. An average big brown bat is against, is, a, is greater than that threshold that is known to cause neurological damage. For the other two species I sampled, little brown bats and northern long-eared bats, the average wasn't above 10, but both of these groups had some individuals that were also above this threshold that is associated with neurological damage. So preliminary me uh, measurements, uh, I had a fourth species that I looked at that wasn't on the graph. All four species included some individuals that exceeded this 10 part per million neurological damage threshold. So at first uh, people looked at this, like this just doesn't make sense. And I still don't think it makes sense, but um, because it was, because the results were so crazy, um, I had some skeptics um, uh, in, I and I was skeptical of my own um, work. So we did further studies. We used two different labs and four different crews um, and they found even higher values in the 20 to 30 part per million range. So the next thing we did is, and this is work I did with uh, Alex Pula and John Shuttle at Environment Canada, uh, Ottawa U and Environment Canada respectively, um, and with the help of bat biologists all over Canada, uh, we put out a call and we said, can you send us fur from bats that you're catching anyway? Um, and we got bats from uh, the uh, from BC all the way to um, Quebec, and we filled in the gaps on the East Coast with previously published information. And we looked at across Canada, west over here uh, to moving to the right, the east, um, across North America. And what we find is um, bats on the two coasts, the east coast here in blue and um, this orangey color and um, BC, this one here, they had the highest values. The green bars are our own data and the other colors are from existing literature. So you have this uh, east to west pattern where really high on the east, also high on the west, 
uh, intermediate in Quebec and Ontario right here and low in the um, prairies. And if you look at maps of atmospheric deposition, um, the bat data matches atmospheric deposition. So this is called a heat map. It just me means the, the redder the color, the higher the mercury deposition. The, the, the units don't matter unless you um, study mercury. The important thing here is it's high on the two coasts where the red is, it's intermediate in Quebec and Ontario where the yellow is, and it's low here on the prairies where the blue is. So atmospheric deposition overlaps or, or, or correlates well with what we find when we look at cross Canada patterns. So that's not too um, surprising when um, there's lots of mercury falling out of the sky, bats get more contaminated. Now, fur is an inert tissue. Once mercury is in the fur, it's not having an effect on the bats anymore. Um, and um, so the, the, the target organs that mercury has detrimental effects on are brain and kidney and liver. We then went to show for many of these sensitive um, tissues here. This is a graph showing that mercury and fur correlates with mercury in brain. Mercury also correlates with um, mercury, mercury and fur also correlates with mercury in both um, um, liver and kidney. Um, these data here are only useful if you understand statistics. Um, and um, so I'm just going to skip over those. Um, so to recap, um, 10 parts per million is not unusual. We've established that the pattern of mercury going from west coast to east coast parallels atmospheric deposition. And mercury in the fur indicates that brain, liver, and tissue, vital organs, are also being exposed um, to mercury. But we still don't know why it's so high, why levels are so high in bats relative to where they fit into the food web. These are some selected um, organisms, marmosets, uh, species of rat, opossums, and two species of carnivores, uh, a ring seal and a river otter. And they're arranged from left to right so that short food web low in the food chain is at the left and higher in the food chain is over here on the right. And you see the expected pattern based on what I said earlier about biomagnification. Now, very low values for omnivores and insectivores, higher values for carnivores. Bats are insectivores, so they're right here where this thin blue line representing a marmoset is. Um, and you can find some insectivores and omnivores with higher mercury levels than what I've shown here. These are kind of hand-picked species, but usually those are associated with um, contaminated sites. This is what you tend to get in normal um, uncontaminated places. If you put bats on this graph, in terms of trophic position or where they are in the food web, they're way over here on the left where you expect a really small value, but they're right off the scale. They're in, often in the, the, the 10 to 20 to 30 range, which is way, way off this scale. And so the work we're doing now is to go from the broad scale, like the work I just showed you, um, to the fine scale. And that's work that Bailey Bedard's been doing um, as part of her master's thesis. We've been sampling bats instead of across Canada, all near Cornwall or Eastern Ontario, at least. So Morrisburg, Cornwall, where we have these known mercury hotspots, um, St. Andrews West, Martintown, Williamstown, those areas. And um, we've been catching bats, clipping fur, attaching these little radio transmitters to them to track them to their feeding sites. And once we know where they're feeding, we then sample insects with a variety of different insect traps that are shown in the top figures here. And we catch these insects, we sort them by species, um, and we're trying to look for links between particular types of insects um, and mercury concentration. And so what we found, we found a couple of things that are interesting. Uh, first of all, um, 
This is this red line here. These are uh, two species of bats, little brown bats and big brown bats. Big brown bats have more mercury than little brown bats. And this is that 10 part per million threshold. So both species have some individuals that exceed that threshold. Big brown bats exceed it very, very often. And sometimes they exceed it by a lot, more than 30 or 40 parts per million. The extra zeros here are because Bailey used different units, but this is the 10, this red line is the 10 ppm threshold. Now, if you look over here, this is the body mass of um, uh, little brown bats. Little brown bats are smaller, thus their name. Big brown bats are bigger. If you control for body, of, uh, body mass differences. So if you factor out mathematically, and I won't explain how to do that in this talk, if you factor out the effects of body size, that's what this figure down here is. Big brown bats still have more mercury. That's um, So if you could make little brown bats and big brown bats the same size, big brown bats would be more contaminated. And what's really interesting about this and another place where bats just defy everything we think we know about mercury is little brown bats are more aquatic. They eat higher proportions of aquatic insects than big brown bats and aquatic insects should be more contaminated. So these bats, these little brown bats should actually be more contaminated than these bats based on what we know about their feeding ecology and how mercury works in food webs. And once again, bats don't fit the picture. Um, we've also compared different locations. Um, not a big difference if we look at little brown bats in averages, but there's a lot more variation in Cornwall. And maybe that variation reflects some of the mercury contamination in Cornwall. If we look at big brown bats, for some reason, Morrisburg is way higher um, than the Raisin River. And for reasons I'm not going to get into due to what we know about mercury, we actually expect the opposite. And once again, Cornwall, Cornwall has a lot of variation. And scientists often compare means or averages. I think there's some interesting things going on here if we forget about means and start looking at variation. So this is just the first step to try to understand really um, in detail what's going on. Bailey has much more data that I don't have time um, to go into. Um, she did confirm that as we expected, aquatic insects here in the blue are more contaminated with mercury than uh, terrestrial insects. Once again, emphasizing that we should be finding high mercury levels in little brown bats, but we're actually finding high mercury levels in big brown bats instead. So I'm going to um, um, wrap it up there. I have a few more slides that I've included just in case questions come up. Um, uh, so um, I'll have to save um, um, wind turbines for the theme of another talk, um, but they are also something that is threatening uh, bat populations across North America. And um, the good news there is we have figured out ways to mitigate those effects. Um, and, um, but as I say, that will be for another topic, another time. So I will um, end my slides and I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to you, Stephanie, for questions. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for presenting and taking the time this evening. And I guess maybe I'll speak for a lot of people as I think like you're the reason that we have this sensitization around bats especially in the Eastern Ontario and Cornwall area. I see often on Facebook pages, people finding bats and then we have comments saying, reach out to bat, uh, Brian and you know a lot of questions about bat houses and things like this. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And um, to everybody watching on Facebook Live, this is your moment to ask Brian any question that you would like. Um, so I'll just be keeping an eye out, eye out on that. Um, so for the moment, we have somebody reaching out from or who's tuning in from Port Hope. 
So hello to the person from Port Hope. Um, so far, I don't have any questions, but I have my own questions. Uh, so we'll just start with that and I'll wait for people to tune in. So, um, so the main question maybe people would ask is where could they acquire a bat house? Right, so uh, they, they, they don't have to look too far. They can uh, uh, contact me and I can do one of two things. I can send them plans to make their own. Um, initially, I had money to build and, and supply free bat houses to people, but um, that money has dried up and now uh, my research money is focused on the follow-up monitoring. But if anybody doesn't have the skills or the time uh, to build a bat house uh, in exchange for uh, the cost of the lumber, I'd gladly uh, build and install bat houses um, for them. If you're far away, I might have to charge you a bit of um, gas money, but um, if you're local, um, there's about $100 of material uh, in the bat house. That includes the four by four post and the um, uh, stone dust and all that uh, cemented into, into place. So they can um, um, still get a bat house, but um, you'll have to be willing to buy me the materials. Awesome. Thank you for your generosity of your time, Brian. <laughs> um, so I don't see any questions yet, but I still have more questions for you. <laughs> um, so how many years do you think it would take for the little brown populations to recover to their numbers from before uh, white nose syndrome? Do you think that's possible? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a that's a tough question. I I think it um, I think it could take uh, decades, um, but um, but I'm optimistic because of what I've seen in the last um, um, couple of years. Uh, and one of the things we really don't know um, is um, um, one of the things we don't know is whether these bats that I'm seeing are, are, are those bats that um, have recovered after having been affected and decimated by um, white nose or um, are they, or did they somehow escape the devastation? You know, maybe all the caves that we know about have um, been infected by the fungus. Maybe there are some remote caves that somehow didn't get affected. I think that's highly unlikely. Maybe some bats already had a tendency to be immune. Uh, and those are the bats um, that we're finding. Um, um, I, I didn't talk in detail about the, the map that showed the locations of the 21 roosts, uh, but there's two, there's two clusters and those are in um, the um, St. Andrews area and the uh, Williamstown um, area, and sorry, and the Morrisburg area in the Williamstown area, and to a lesser extent, St. Andrews, which isn't too far away from Williamstown. So as far as the bat's concerned, that may be all the same area. I'm not sure those areas are unique. I think those are just the areas where um, I um, happen to do the most work. And also, um, when I say that uh, eight of my 175 were occupied, um, I only checked about 20 or 30 of those 175. And so there are probably other bats uh, in bat houses uh, in places I just didn't have time to get to. Um, the, um, um, yeah, so that's all I'll um, uh, say about that. Um, I, I got a, a question uh, directly by text, someone uh, circumventing uh, <laughs> these stuff. And uh, it's one that a lot of people ask. Um, so um, how do um, how do we um, get bats to leave our house and move into your bat house? Um, so the um, unfortunately, the only way um, to encourage them to do that is to block the holes on on your. Uh, house and uh, because I know who's sending me that question, uh, that's a real challenge because you have a really tall three-story house that standard ladders um, and, and standard levels of bravery don't allow uh, access to. So you need uh, uh, to find uh, one of those bucket lifts and someone who's willing to uh, go up into those. 
um, to, to close those holes. So that's the challenge. It's always possible, but it sometimes takes persistence and money and, and expertise to find and close those holes. Um, and uh, the other part of your question is a great presentation. How do we get you on Quirks and Quarks? Uh, I can't answer that one, but if by chance Bob McDonald is listening, uh, you, you know where to contact me. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for whoever it was that contacted Brian for these yes, questions. Yes, that was Ellen, Eleanor, who Amazing. has one of my bat houses. So I, I'll just take a moment to say bye to everyone who's watching us from Kojiko. So Facebook Live will continue. But everyone who's watching from your TV, I'll say good night. And we'll see you uh, next month. Um, so thanks again for tuning in. Okay, so I'll go to the next question, Brian. So they're all coming in pretty quickly. Uh, so somebody's asking is, I want to know how to mitigate wind turbines. So I guess the question is about wind turbines. Okay, yeah, so um, I should probably do um, another talk um, entirely on wind turbines. So um, we, we, know, um, we know that um, wind turbines do um, the majority of the damage to bats in, in small specific periods of time. And um, if during those periods of time, um, the blades are feathered, which means they're tilted at an angle, so they're not generating as much um, of a low pressure zone, and they're also not generating enough, uh, as much electricity when the blades are feathered, um, you can reduce fatalities um, dramatically. And wind turbine companies, um, usually in their mitigation plans, um, are supposed to propose those sorts of things. Um, the, um, my frustration is um, our system for allowing wind turbines or any, um, any type of industry to operate, it's, it's an adversarial system. And scientists are supposed to come in and evaluate and, and um, provide data, do experiments, uh, but science wasn't designed for that kind of an adversarial system that was designed for lawyers and courtrooms and judges. And as a scientist, it's really hard to work in that kind of uh, a system. We've got the research, we've got the tools to mitigate, maybe not eliminate deaths, um, but it just becomes so hard to even get in there and have those discussions because you've got the business and you've got the um, people objecting to wind turbines and you've got the government agencies and they're all fighting with one another. And so I say, I'm just going to go find a bat cave. Same place I go when people don't like my ideas. I just go find a bunch of people and go hang out in the bat cave and eventually something good comes out of it and I give a talk about it. So that's my big frustration with, um, with the, the whole system because we, uh, we know how to mitigate the death. And the other thing I'll add is um, because the maximum number of deaths occur in specific conditions, um, when you mitigate them, the wind turbine companies don't lose a ton of revenue um, because the periods that are so you can you can minim, you can eliminate 80 percent of the deaths by only impacting 20 percent of the uh, generating potential. So uh, as a bat biologist and someone concerned about nature in general, I think that's a pretty good trade-off. Thank you, Brian. That's a great answer. It's a very tricky place to be in. Um, so I do have somebody who's asking me a question. I'm just going to reply to them directly. So they're asking if they could verbally ask a question. So unfortunately, the way that we do this with Facebook Live is you'd have to, you'll have to type in your question uh, for us to get to it. So the next I would, question. I'll just say to that person uh, who I presume is listening, uh, you can certainly contact um, me at the River Institute. Um, send me an email, say you, were, um, you heard the talk. Uh, and um, I can give you a call and we can have a discussion. Thank you, Brian. So uh, one of our colleagues, he typed into the comment section to let you know to send us a message to our Facebook page or go to our website and find an email address. Um, so 
Uh, we have a question coming in. So does the fungus continue to live in the roosts after all the bats are gone or can they return to previously infected sites? Um, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. It's possible that um, researchers have figured that out. Um, I think the, um, um, in general, fungi are fairly robust organisms that can live in, in soil for long periods um, of time in dormant conditions. Uh, so I suspect that um, the fungus is gonna stay in those caves um, um, for a long time and, and um, it will only die out slowly if bats um, uh, become immune to it and, and it can no longer spread. Great, thank you, that was a good question. Uh, the next question is, do you foresee the treatment becoming easier to administer so that maybe an owner could leave a treated food source in the cave rather than having to have a biologist administer it? Um, oh. think. That's a great, that, that's a great question. So I think we, um, I, I think that's feasible. The problem is at a grander scale, there's, um, there's so few people who are in a situation where um, they have access to a cave on, or, or a mine on their own property, and also the, the willingness to, um, to do that themselves. But um, um, that's, a, that, that's a great question. Um, if bats move back into these sites and are getting infected, um, then that's feasible. Um, the problem in most cases is um, the bats are gone. So you're not going to find the sick bats because they've already been killed. They were killed 10 years ago. Um, but if you do find, if, if you do find a cave where there are bats and you can see the fungus on their noses, uh, then um, if it's, if you own the land and you have the, um, um, the wherewithal to go and do the treatment, then yeah, maybe it is possible. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and I could see people being willing to do it. You know, I'm sure there's some. Yeah. And so I'm, uh, I'm guessing I know who that question came from. Um, and because uh, I think I have visited that place <laughs> this fall a number of times. Uh, so the person's name is Graham Watson? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. who I anticipated. <laughs> um, hi, hi, Graham. Um, I should look into that. Uh, if the bats come back and we see fungus on their noses, uh, we can go treat them for sure. <laughs> okay, next question. So I have a question about relocating bats. If you say rescue or remove an unwanted bats from a property on way back, Google says yes, depending on the distance. But I would love to hear uh, what you have to say, Brian. Okay, um, when so you were my question, uh, one word cut out. So they were. Uh, this is someone asking um, how how far away can you bring bats um, and and still have them able to come back to where they were from? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, really long distances. So in the um, in the early days of bat ecology, Brock Fenton would catch bats um, locally and he'd bring them hundreds of kilometers away to do um, a bat talk and a show and tell somewhere. And he would, he would tag and release the bat as part of the show and tell. And it would fly back home hundreds of kilometers to wherever he'd initially um, captured it. Um, so, to, um, so to relocate bats um, far enough away that they won't find their way home, you really have to bring them far. Um, which is which is also not legal to do um, because there are rules um, pr um, preventing that. Um, so if you're following the rules anyway, you can't do that. Um, the rules don't make a lot of sense um, because bats fly so far on their own anyway. Um, the rules are really made for things like raccoons and skunks that could potentially have rabies and then you might move them and introduce rabies to somewhere else. But bats are flying hundreds of kilometers on their own. So um, I'm not sure that rule makes a whole lot of sense for bats, but it's a rule for any mammal um, in Ontario. 
Thank you, Brian. Sorry, I don't know if I'm cutting out sometimes. My internet's having some problems. Um, You're good now. Okay, thank you. So let's see. Yeah, and I, I suppose with relocating, and I don't know if you said this, but if the bat has a, a pup, then that could be detrimental for its baby as well. Yeah, so I, I was assuming in that those comments that um, you know it would be um, a post reproductive adult. Um, um, yeah, obviously, if it's in the stage where the bats have pups, you definitely wouldn't want to do that. Great. Um, so somebody's asking me: Are there any other he heavy metals that you're researching other than mercury in bats? So. Um, I've been focusing just on mercury, um, but um, there are other there are other metals that um, I would potentially be interested in looking at, and one of them is selenium, because it turns out when you have a lot of selenium in your body, you can tolerate higher levels of mercury without detrimental effects. Um, there's a um, scientist in um, just across the border um, uh, from us here in Cornwall at Potsdam. Um, and her name is uh, Beatrice um, um, Hernot. And she's um, been um, working on other metals. Um, and I'm trying to collaborate with her. Our collaboration has been slowed down by the closed border, but things seem to be improving on that front. Um, so, yeah, there are other metals that we could look at. One of the reasons the focus is on mercury is it bioaccumulates, it magnifies as you move up the food chain. A lot of other heavy metals um, don't magnify as much. That doesn't mean they're healthy um, in high quantities. Um, but, um, yeah, so I haven't looked at them, but I'm definitely interested in looking more at some of the other metals in bats. And initially I did do a complete metal scan uh, on that. The, the first slide I showed of the three bats, um, three out of the four that I actually studied, I, I showed mercury data, but I actually did a scan for all sorts of other metals. But when I saw the mercury and how high it was for such a um, low position in the food chain, that kind of drew all my attention. And I never even looked at any of the other metal data uh, after, uh, after that initial publication, because um, the mercury has been so interesting. Thank you, Brian. And that was a great question. I'm curious to see um, that collaboration between you and the scientist on the American side. So for now, I think I'm at the end of the questions, but maybe I'll give a few seconds to everybody to put in, in last words. We did get a thank you, Brian, from Kerry McDonald. That's uh, that's great. Yeah. So that's the that's the teacher from Iona who's got a bat house and the kids are raising money to protect bats. And it's a it's an awesome school. We need more teachers like Carrie from Iona. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure she appreciated your comment. And, Brian. They're, and they're little kids, too. It's like a, a kindergartens and um, the, the really young grades, which is really great to, um, uh, great to see. I guess just to add to that one of, so one of your employees, Lexi had made some little bats that uh, students could measure and do their tests on. Um, do you want to, do you want to share about that? I thought it was pretty, pretty neat. Oh yeah. So one of the, one of my colleagues who, uh, really likes, uh, doing crafty stuff, the, uh, and has all the talents that I lack for that sort of thing. Um, we were doing, um, uh, we did a high school um, program as part of our conference where high school students were doing all the bat measurements that I was doing, but it was winter and of course there were no bats and furthermore, they're not trained to handle bats safely. So Lexi made perfectly anatomically correct bats that weigh the same amount as a real bat and have the same wing measurements and uh, they even took little uh, fur clippings uh, from these um, uh, fake bats that she made um, and uh, um, she hid them in bat bags um, the way I would be holding a, bag, a bat in a bag that's waiting to um, have its fur clipped or be weighed and uh, yeah so it was uh, some of them were even convinced they were going to open up the bag and, and find a real bat so um, 
that was a great um, great activity. Maybe there'll be some field assistance result from that. <laughs> Starting young. <laughs> and I think there might be a couple of um, future field assistants uh, already uh, also uh, listening. If you're out there, uh, Naya, thanks for turning in, tuning in. And uh, the Montpetit family might be listening as well. They have some budding bat biologists or fish biologists in the household. You've had a pretty big impact, I think, uh, in our region, Brian. Um, so I, I don't have any more questions, but I do have some thank yous. So Graham says, thanks, Brian. Good stuff. A bit scary, but hopefully the little guys will rebound. All right. Thank you, Graham. I will see you next field season. And then uh, Jeanette Paquette Gadbois says, very, very informative. Thank you. <laughs> so I think with that, maybe we could wrap it up for tonight and for the right. science and nature. So thanks again for taking the time so late in the evening. I know in the day you're pretty busy teaching. And I guess we'll see you. We'll probably see you soon. You give a lot of presentations. I do. <laughs> yeah. So to everybody watching on Facebook Live, thank you so much again for tuning in and we'll see you next month. So it will be not the first Wednesday, it will be the second Wednesday of December. Usually it's the first one, but it will be the second one. You'll see the poster come online. So thanks again for uh, stopping in. Have a good night. Bye everyone.